works with the uh, Winter Lecture Series, I'm happy to take questions and uh, hopefully I can answer them. I suspect there will be some fairly sophisticated uh, questions from, from all of you, so please. Yeah. Sudan or Zambia and, and others where they're huge. Um, making roads, and developing infrastructure, making dams like some of the dams, the Meroe Dam in, uh, on the fourth cataract of the Nile was done by the Chinese. I had a lot of students working on that dam looking at the archaeology and the human impacts of that dam. They didn't pay any attention to the displacement. 50,000 people were taken, farmers and, and fishermen were taken from the the Nile and literally dumped in the desert. Uh, so they don't necessarily follow human rights standards. That's a huge problem. And uh, on the other hand, they're providing employment, they're providing training. So there's, it's kind of a mixed bag, but there's no question that almost anywhere in Africa, the Chinese own all of the small stores, and that's the end, is through small general dealerships, and then they expand out. So recently, in fact, one of our UNL graduates was telling me, I was in Washington in December, and he said that well, when they had this discovery in, in, uh, because of an accident that occurred in Nairobi, that the Chinese have these listening posts, which we do as well, of course, and, and the Europeans, uh, in Africa, that they were coordinating all of these um, activities, including the, the removal of, of uh, cultural property from uh, Benin in, in Nigeria or various kinds of other materials uh, going back to China. So, and, and spying at the same time. So there's a, it's a complicated picture. You've got the diplomatic aspects and you've got the, the economic aspects, but they are the, the big players on the block. And that's why all these other countries want to kind of reduce their requirements about uh, development uh, initiatives and try and become more like China. And I personally don't think that's a good road to follow. I'm a graduate of UNL, retired foreign service officer, served in Africa twice in Nigeria, three times, twice in Nigeria, 12 countries in West Africa, DROC, lots of questions. Yeah. But first I would say, wow, this is the first one of these lectures I've been to. Good Lord, what a show. Fabulous. Thank you. <laughs> The U.S. role in Africa has been huge and, and yeah. continues to be. If you know the name of Linda Thomas Greenfield, uh -huh. she was my protege in Lagos' first tour. Um, if you know the name Professor Peter Wangyu, mm -hmm. who many people may know here, he was one of the announced candidates for the position of president of the University of Nebraska. He's my mentor. And I'm absolutely hooked on Nigeria. Um, have been for years. We're now working, if I can do a little bit of commercial here, then I'll ask the question. Just One Girl, a program. We have a nonprofit in memory of my daughter who was murdered 22 years ago. She was a great fan of Nigeria, University of Maryland graduate. Just One Girl. Our idea is to help just one Nigerian schoolgirl come for one year. We're now, I live with a Ukrainian family in, in, um, near Eagle, We're talking about bringing plane loads of Ukrainian girls. And I enroll visa officers, so I kind of know how to do this. They, they either all get visas or, they, or none of them do. But it's 
problem is all over Africa. It's all over the world. Out of the blue, Jerry Bremer, I don't know if he was our, our uh, coalition provisional uh, authority, and, and he served in, in uh, Malawi as a junior officer, and he's helping five families. Donor fatigue, I mean, you must see it all the time, what you do. Just curious about your reaction to this idea. Let's just start with one. I think it's the best way to start, and I'd say Nigeria is a classic example, given the uh, kidnapping of the 300 schoolgirls in northern Nigeria by Boko Haram. Most of those girls haven't been recovered, and they've probably been disseminated in the population of Boko Haram. And uh, Nigeria has all of those issues, as many other parts of Africa do, but particularly Nigeria. And as you probably know, there's a substantial Ogoni population, has been in Lincoln, it's dispersed now to other cities around the country. Uh, so there's been an interest in the Niger Delta and the River State and that kind of thing. Uh, and the University of Nebraska has had a long history with, uh, the, with Nigeria, uh, as has Michigan State and a number of other places. Um, but it's very hard to help because of the complexities of governance. We don't know who's going to be the new president. Will it be good luck, Jonathan? Or will Will it be the, his op opponent, who's an ex-military guy? That many people want him because they think he'll crack down more. Uh, but I think in many of these cases, you do have to start literally with one or two. We've tried doing that with San uh, and, and have been successful in bringing a few to the United States. And then to go back, we'd really like to have them become lawyers um, if they could. And then I think having the law on their side would be very useful. Um, but again, some of that has to do with U.S. policy and particularly with Homeland Security. There are certain countries that they don't want people coming from. I mean, they would for a while, at least South Sudan, for instance. But Sudan itself, much more difficult. Or Lesotho, for a variety of reasons, which is a fairly benign country in some ways, but they have very, fairly easy access to passports, and that's how many people get into into South Africa is through Lesotho. So the U.S. won't let people in, won't let people from Lesotho in. So you have to solve the problem both on the Africa level, get the funding, you've got the donor fatigue problem, people not wanting to give money for this. But if you start out individually and, and build from there, I think that's the best strategy you could possibly to do. Could well, possibly do. Actually, there's a provision of the law of the, and the visa regulations for one year for a secondary student to come. There has to be a payment of $3,400 to the school district school district can always give them money back. And, right. and once they're here, is anybody going to make them go back? No. No, they're not. In fact, I had some friends who are trying to bring people out. They're worried about Damascus falling. And, and this is sort of, uh, you know, in the quiet, but they're worried about ISIS taking over Damascus. And so they're trying to get relatives out now. And these are various people who have approached me and, and, and others that I work with. They're concerned about what's happening, obviously, in Syria. And Dave and others have, have alluded to that. Um, but it's, it's not easy because of the visa process. I mean, just getting uh, a European to get a visa in Berlin is hard to do. So, uh, because they're backed up and asylum seekers and others. So it's, uh, it's complicated, but you're right. Once they get here, they can stay, but they have to stay under the radar and then you have all those kinds of let, complexities. Let me just make one final point. Anybody here remember the name of Robert Ray? former governor of Iowa, mm -hmm. at the fall of Saigon, he said, give me 10,000. I want Pete Ricketts to show leadership Absolutely. in this state. Fantastic. Give us 10 plane loads. The unfortunate thing is, as you know, many, I mean, there are people in Kearney, for example, who are from Myanmar, Burma. There are lots of others, and there are all of these efforts to try and get this done, but it does take work. And I, I believe me, I think the Obama administration is doing as well as they can in some of these areas, but they literally are overwhelmed. Uh, and I, I would also say that they have kind of arcane and, and uh, complicated procedures to get people into the U.S., uh, especially students. And J-1 visa system has changed and all kinds of things. So uh, some of it is our problem and some of it is the trying to process people out of Kakuma or whatever camp or you know, out of various parts of Nigeria. But I think starting with one is great, and as I mentioned, today's International Women's Day, so this is a good, uh, a good day to talk about that kind of thing. Netanyahu recently made it very obvious that American Jews have a whole lot of impact on our policy abroad. My impression generally is that most other immigrant groups have very little impact at all. Am I wrong? Am I right? 
Mm -hmm. Assuming I'm right, why do they have, what do they need to do differently, or do they really, are they really not interested? I think they're, I don't know that any group has that much impact on our policy, unfortunately. I wish more groups had uh, impact on U.S. policy. Um, it's hard for me to judge whether uh, the American Jewish population have a greater uh, impact. They certainly have strong voices in some areas. They have the ear of some people in Congress. Uh, other groups, to some extent, I'd say less Africa, uh, do as well. Um, and I think the, the question is trying to, to strengthen all of the groups at the same time. Netanyahu did raise, I mean, his, his speech did raise some of these kinds of of, of issues, uh, but overall I think that uh, looking at at least the populations that I'm familiar with in Africa, very few of them have much uh, impact on trying to uh, affect U.S. policy. They'd like to have a, a greater say, clearly. How to do that, I'm not sure. It's not just about money, it's not just about access to uh, the media, it's a whole set of things. Some of it's changing the American mind about uh, some of the populations. I mean, we have a sense, for example, of, of populations, say, from Pakistan as potentially being complex, but if you look at the long history of Pakistani U.S. involvement and, and many uh, positive things that have happened in Pakistan, I mean, I think that you know, we're, we're, one of the things that we have a tendency to do, I think, as a, as a nation, and political scientists can correct me, but is to look at the countries that have the most clout, and certainly right now, India, uh, Russia, uh, China have a lot of clout, other countries a lot less so. I think it's both a country issue and it's as well as an ethnicity issue. I think there are 7,300 ethnic groups on the planet with all those different languages and cultures. Uh, it's it's tr to try and represent all of that is, is hard. You do need a, a good voice for refugees and immigrants in the United States, for a good immigration policy, for amnesty like Obama's trying to do. I personally think that's a good idea. Uh, make it a law. I mean, change the whole way we look at, at immigration. But I worked not that long ago in Denmark and saw the issues in Denmark. Uh, same in France. Um, these are complicated things to solve, and there is definitely an anti-immigrant feeling in this country as well as other places. And I think trying to work on that would be really useful. Um, <clears throat> this question is sort of nitty gritty. You mentioned several times, I worked with this group, I worked with this group, and so on. I want to know, when you get up in the morning and you're working with this group, what do you do? <laughs> That's a great question. <laughs> I spend a lot of time on Skype. Melinda will tell you that, uh, that I uh, tend to you know, I do that from about 4 in the morning to about 8, usually. Um, and then a lot of email, uh, and then trying to do fundraising and that kind of thing. And my problem is I have too many interests, and I'm working on too many different things. Uh, but some of it is trying to get other people to do some things as well. And, and anthropologists, uniformly as a group, are not what I call activists. I mean, you know, they're 30 to 1, blue versus red, as a, as a discipline in terms of their politics, but in terms of being activists, advocates on the ground, uh, there aren't that many. A lot of the, the better known anthropologists are more interested in academic questions than they are in the advocacy. Now that's changing, but anthropology was the last major discipline to come along with the Human Rights Committee, and we fought for 10 years to get it in place. Anthropologists in 1947 voted against uh, uh, the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. I mean, it, we, do not, we have a lot to answer for. Um, but I would say that, that there are people, especially in the NGO community, who are doing a lot more to try and help that, and getting those people uh, motivated is really useful. I've started working a lot with journalists and trying to convince them about maybe a better way to do things than shoot to kill policies with conservation. Uh, and they, some of them seem receptive, so I end up talking to them quite a bit. But a lot of it ends up being the media and trying to convince people to get involved. I think you know where I'm going to go with it. Yeah. Uh, but uh, before I do, I, I one uh, uh, one term that came up that was interesting to me that I'll look into some more is the conservation refugees. Mm -hmm. I had known about obviously the phenomenon, but hadn't thought of it as a class of refugees. So uh, thank you for that. Um, 1978, uh, the gods must be crazy. The Coke bottle falls out of the air. 
airplane and the Bushmen are changed. Uh, looking at your picture of the kids in front of the computer, it raises the whole question or issue for me of this role of modernization and what's the, what's the impact of this induced kind of modernization? Um, how, do, how are they grappling with balancing maintenance of their cultural identities with the obvious need and desire to modernize at least in terms of a better quality of life uh, for themselves? That's a hugely important question and it's one I get asked all the time since I work with the population that was in that picture who were the grandchildren of the ones who were in The Gods Must Be Crazy, uh, who was the, the film star. Uh, he contributed a lot of his money that he made from the film, which wasn't very much, he didn't have a percentage, but it was a very well-selling foreign film, um, to education, and that's where a lot of our work is going now for the Kalahari People's Fund. It is causing some pretty huge issues. One of them would be a big gap between young and old. The older people are not literate, they don't know how to use a computer, uh, a few of them might have cell phones, but many of them don't speak English, and that's a disadvantage. Um, so, the younger kids, uh, they're familiar with the world, but they're leaving a lot of their old traditions behind. And as an anthropologist, some of those concern me, like, uh, maybe it doesn't matter to a lot of people about the loss of hunting skills or tracking skills or whatever, and they have used them in nefarious ways. Admittedly, they assisted the South African Defense Force in the battles in Angola and northern Namibia as trackers, and they're still being used that way around the world. Um, but I think the biggest problems really are uh, getting into education and that this is causing social divisions, especially between the young and the old. And they are losing a lot of their traditions and many of the kinds of work we, much of the kind of work we do is to try and maintain those traditions. So the question you would ask is why would you want people to know how to do arrow poison hunting and using arrow poison? Well, arrow poison happens to be pretty important to American uh, surgical systems. Curare is an arrow poison used in the Amazon many of these kinds of drugs come out of those types of, act of activities. Uh, the same with uh, uh, some of the diet drugs, Kudia, Gordona, and some of these other things that people use. So there's a, a lot of indigenous knowledge which is important and, and various pharmaceutical companies are trying to tap into that, the body shop and you know, various others. Uh, so the loss of that indigenous knowledge is hugely important. And I think the bottom line is that uh, um, what I see happening with, with cell phones is, yeah, the kids are uh, more educated, but they're also wanting to move into town. They want regular jobs, and unfortunately in Southern Africa there aren't that many jobs to be had, so you get a whole set of people who are kind of disaffected young males especially, and we've seen what the effects of that were in Rwanda and elsewhere in Palestine, and some of the implications of that. So trying to deal with those social cleavages, which are being exacerbated by modernization, is really important. Um, the kids themselves, they seem happy. Uh, one of the problems we're dealing with now is it used to be elephants that would come in and knock down the electric fences and, and destroy the, the water points. Well, now it's cell phones. They use cell phones. They short out the, the electric uh, batteries we're using to try and protect the water points. It's costing us a lot of money to try and come up with new kinds of batteries that are cell phone proof. Um, and the other thing is people are going broke. Uh, with cell phones. I mean, you have pay-as-you-go kinds of cell phones, and a lot of families we know are, are having real difficulties with that. I mean, any parent would tell you what their, their kid is doing on the cell phone or how many texts they send and that kind of thing, and that is a problem. But I think the best part of it is the education. I mean, these kids are excited. They're doing interesting things, and, and I think it's helping in a lot of ways the society, but there are some downsides. Cell phones are particularly peculiar because the Millennium Development Goals, they're, they're using the cell phone expansion as a measure of achieving the goals. And well, that's the right, goals. and as you know, they're, they're questioning some of the, the efficacy of some of the Millennium Development Goals and trying to define them into more measurable kinds of indicators and more realistic kinds of indicators. It's, and one of them is the digital divide. We'll have X number of people having access to Wi-Fi. I have access, difficulties with access to Wi-Fi and what health care. I mean, these kids I'm dealing with have better access to Wi-Fi than I do, and they're in the northern Kalahari. I find that interesting. But I think that's Comcast, and that's just my opinion. <laughs> a, question, a question from two perspectives. Okay. A question from two perspectives.
question from two perspectives. The first perspective from an anthropological view, the second from your personal perspective, and what would you like to see occur. My observation is that we have all focused primarily on helping those people that have been displaced. Yeah. And that's worthy and a fine objective. My question is, what do you anticipate being the logical outcome of the complex situation that exists in Africa? Well, that's a great question because the, the, the relocation issue is a huge part. I mean, it's, it's um, the people of concern that we're talking about, persons of concern. A lot of it is that they've been displaced from their homes uh, by various processes. I think, yes, conservation refugees, it's a small percentage of Africa's population, but if you look at the increasing rigidity of, of parks in Central Africa, uh, literally millions of people have been displaced and continue to be by non-government organizations such as World Wildlife Fund and Conservation International and others. And I think there could be a better way of doing it. Um, but the other point is uh, um, looking at, at Africa, there are many people who haven't been displaced who are not getting any kind of assistance and they get some basic NGO assistance and there are organizations Heifer Project International, for a good as a good example, providing livestock to people is very useful, or poultry and that kind of thing, uh, in a, a revolving uh, kind of loan basis, uh, and people pay it back. And that's working reasonably well. Some of the, the microcredit schemes have worked rel relatively well with people who haven't been displaced. The problem is, is essentially a combination of donor fatigue and the money available, and it's a uh, since 2008, a lot of the big NGOs are really hurting, and they haven't been able to build up their assets uh, since that time. Uh, some of them have, but um, they're putting it in different areas. A lot more money is going into governance, or and they wouldn't call it this, but counterterrorism. Um, I think that they should be much more uh, attentive to poverty, poverty alleviation, gender, um, minority status, and that kind of thing, because those are the populations that are most effect, affected. Is what we're saying then that Africa lacks the unified perspective to help try to cure their own ills? Must they always depend on the outside, or will they be able at some point in time to rectify some of those problems from within? I think they can absolutely uh, rectify them from within. I think one of the issues in Africa uh, and you, a lot of it does depend on good leadership. Um, if you compare Mandela, for example, with, uh, uh, with Jacob Zuma, the leadership issues are, are you know, palpable, they're hugely important. Uh, much of the money going into the ANC and into supporters of, of Zuma, um, which South Africa would be a lot better off with a more balanced, equitable, kind of democratic uh, allocation of resources. Uh, but. I think much of Africa, they are operating on their own. They are doing a lot of kinds of things, some places uh, less effectively than others. But part of the problem, and several people have said it to me here, is population. I mean, you've got 140 million, arguably, in, in Nigeria, um, and you've got, uh, I don't know, 140 or 150 ethnic groups and languages. Uh, trying to bring that together is hard, and especially with the colonial languages, with Portuguese and French. And, and English and German, etc. Uh, you don't have a uniform uh, playing field in Africa for a whole set of reasons. Some of it's geographic, some of it's cultural, some of it's colonial history. Um, but I think my feeling is that most of the people I'm working with, they're working hard to help themselves, and I have a feeling that it could happen uh, Africa-wide. I don't think the African Union is as effective as it could be, uh, but it's getting better on some some things. Um, and I think that that uh, my sense is that they're doing a lot more than we are to kind of help things. Yeah. Uh, Bob, yeah. uh, nice to have you back in town. Yeah, it's good to be back. Uh, in focusing on refugees and internally displaced people, we tend to hear about the situations that stay bad or get worse. Yeah. Darfur, Somalia, mm -hmm. Central African Republic, Libya is a mess now, etc. Are there cases in Africa where refugees and IDPs have been relatively well handled, uh, either resettled or allowed to go back home 
Is it Burundi? Is it Ivory Coast? Can you, can again, it not be all gloom and doom? And can you tell us about some success stories that maybe sure. don't make the Western media? One of them would be Burundi to some extent, although they have internal, as you know, struggles uh, <coughs> politically, uh, Hutu, Tutsi, etc. Um, uh, but I, I always look at Namibia because when the um, peace was, was kind of uh, peace negotiations worked in after the death of Jonas Savimbi in, uh, in um, Angola, there were 23,000 refugees in the refugee camp in, in Namibia, a place called Osiri, uh, in 2001, and there are 6,000 now, many of them Somalis and Zimbabweans. Um, so the Angola repatriation returnee process has gone reasonably well. Um, so you do see cases where that's, that's uh, been effective, and Angola is one example. And to some extent that's true of, of Mozambique as well, although Mozambique now has some more struggles uh, that, are going, that are occurring. Um, but I think that if you look across Africa, Kenya has done a, a reasonable job in some ways on, on handling all these refugees. Uh, I think they could do a better job, but they've tried to, to handle large numbers of people. Um, and you know, some people are going back, uh, they're not going back easily to Somalia, but they are certainly going back to Ethiopia, and that did happen in Somalia in the 80s uh, as well. But I'd say that there are some uh, success stories, not very many admittedly, because things are kind of roiled up at the moment, like you say, CAR and others, which have been going for about a year, uh, Central African Republic and, and other places, and some of that is the local people aren't being as affected as, as uh, certain segments of the population, Christians. And in, in all those cases you mentioned, it seemed like there was some basic peace agreement That's true. in the country that was generating the refugees, and that allowed <coughs> return, and return and repatriation. Yeah, peace agreements what, are what, what about, so now. What about absent that uh, development toward peace in these countries? Are there examples of successful uh, uh, resettlement, reintegration in the uh, host country, not the home to country? To some extent, you see that um, Sierra Leone would be one, uh, although it's got problems with Ebola and, and other things, but Sierra Leone would be one. Liberia, for a while, was working reasonably well in that way of, of reintegrating uh, warring uh, members of the population and getting returnees. Um, all of West Africa has gotten more complicated because of part of disease issues and, and, and costs. Um, there aren't very many uh, examples that I can think of off the top of my head where a peace agreement hasn't been the basis for, for returning. I mean, there's a, obviously there's a lot of mobility, as you well know, with people going across the borders and trying to set themselves up. The problem is trying to stay there long enough to be able to plant a, uh, a set of crops and, and to sustain themselves that way. And that's hard, I mean, especially when you've got a combination of not only the insecurity problem, but you've got drought and, and other things. And then, as was mentioned to me in the, in the break, the land grabs that are going on, huge land grabs by private companies, not just Chinese, a lot of them are American companies and others. And this is going on throughout Africa. So, for example, Southwest Ethiopia, they've taken much of the land of about 12 different ethnic groups uh, to build this Gabre Dam. Uh, which goes into Lake Turkana, but that uh, has meant that they've displaced all of these people uh, and they've given all of that to a big sugar company, a single sugar company. Wow. The same is happening in Zambia. So the land grab dimension of this is complicating the picture and that raises the question, the really se severe question in Africa, of what do you do about communal land versus commercial land and the questions of eminent domain and all the questions that are being asked here in Nebraska about uh, Keystone XL, and do you have the right to take people's land? And governments are doing that right, you know, right and left in Africa, and they're giving it often to foreigners. And by foreigners, I mean Americans and Europeans and Arabs. That's a huge problem that has to be addressed. And that's, I think that's exacerbating what we're talking about. It isn't just the conflicts, it's the, the overt allocation of land uh, to other people, especially transnationals. I'll be here next. Robert. 
my comment or question is a rather uh, very specific one that deals with uh, the taking of land for conservation purposes. Now, I'm not talking about these land grants. Right. I'm only talking about uh, uh, conservation of uh, uh, resources. Uh, I mean, of uh, wildlife and, and yeah. forest. Wild, wild, and, yeah. yeah. Uh, and I, I understand. I understand why there is a temptation to continue even the past policy that you talked about uh, for tourism. There's a, there's a lot of money in that and so forth. However, uh, in Nepal, and I think some states in Brazil have said, okay, the indigenous people that are living here have a lot of investment in maintaining this. And rather than trying to send in an uh, army of, to fight the poachers, let's have these people de uh, develop the area in an indigenous way and, and help them that way. Right. Do you see that as a possibility in other parts of? Uh, certainly, and it, and it is happening. Um, something, I'd say less so in Africa than, than say, Nepal and India and, and parts of Asia and parts of Latin America. I mean, if you look at Latin America and the indigenous population is a substantial part of Brazil or a substantial part of Bolivia or Ecuador, so they have some clout. And Evo Morales in Bolivia is an example as an indigenous leader, although he hasn't necessarily been as, as friendly to other indigenous people as he might be. Um, but What's happening, and largely I, I would fault the conservation movement, especially in Central Africa and to some extent Southern, is that they've been um, pushing people out and then they'll turn over the control of the uh, organization, of the park management, say, to a private NGO uh, or to a company. That might work for some, but it's not going to work for the majority of the indigenous people, certainly. And so there's been this massive move, especially in the last three years, of uh, indigenous people being pushed out of parks. And many of those parks are not necessarily being uh, conserved. A lot of them are being divided up, as happened here in the States, uh, among mining companies and others. So many of the, the controls that we had in the past of, of the kinds of tourism that are done, uh, if you have you know, 12 large tourism companies, wilderness safaris from South Africa, etc. Uh, it's a little complicated, but I would say we've gone to court now. We've got six cases. We've been we've won all of them. They're expensive. It costs two hundred thousand to two million a, a case. We won the Central Kalahari. The people who were removed from Central Kalahari in the nineties and two thousands are back there now. Uh, they don't have water. They finally won the right to water, which would be useful for people in Nebraska too, uh, to have the right human right to water, which was a legal case and it was recognized by the African. Union uh, and hopefully by the UN. So I think that um, there are cases, but it's not easy to, to do. And uh, some of the ones in Brazil, for example, they did have indigenous people managing them, Shingu and others with the Kayapo, uh, and that's worked to some extent. But the other difficulty is people coming in independently and setting up small farms and that kind of thing. So independently of the larger conservation initiatives. That uh, that are in place. And the other thing that worries me, frankly, is the combination of World Heritage Sites under UNESCO, the United Nations Education, Scientific and Cultural Organization, and uh, all the forests that are being you know, now monetized, a lot of the forests that are, we're talking about for various kinds of climate change activities, a lot of those forests that did have indigenous people are now removing those indigenous people and allowing forest companies to come in and log and things like that. So to me, a lot of the the high brand things that, that look good, the Okavango Delta becoming the thousandth World Heritage Site in June of last year. They've kicked out 6,000 indigenous people already, and Botswana has in the last year. That's what I'm monitoring now. So I think that some of these things look good on the surface, um, but if you really start unpacking them, uh, they get a little complicated. And I think the whole climate change initiative is being used as a way of taking control over more forests. And that's at the expense of people, and particularly you see this in India, 
would be just 63 tiger reserves in India alone. And the indigenous people have been living in them. More and more they're being asked to leave. And they're letting other people, private companies that will take people out on elephants to watch, including Lincoln-based companies, to look at uh, uh, to look at tigers. You know, local people don't like to live with tigers very much, but they have to. So. I have a very complicated question. Mm -hmm. I'm trying to figure out how or if Americans need to be educated like you've done to us tonight to keep track of what's going on there because da, 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 um, is there nothing that the American public can do other than my guess is just be educated as to what's going on is there's nothing we can well, that's do? a great question watching the watering down of the media in the United States yes. uh, to me <laughs> uh, you can get lots of uh, sources of information I've been trying to track these in fact for this talk I tried to look at all Human Rights Watch and all these other groups that are working say on Sudan Eric Reeves and Smith and have they have their websites almost all of these websites are being attacked hacked <laughs> by governments especially Sudan and this has all happened in the last two months. Um, so there's a systematic effort to try and make the access to American, for Americans to information much less possible. And I, think, I see the, the media itself watering down. If you just watch, all you have to do is watch uh, mainstream media and see the, the, the stories that you know, spend more time on the Oscars than they do on some of these yeah. situations. And I understand why, um, because it's, you know, it's hard to listen to this some of the complexities, especially right now with the spread of ISIS and, and other things. Um, so I think that there are lots of people who do pay attention to some of these sources of information, but the kinds of information is either one, so detailed, uh, and it is depressing some of it, or two, uh, we're not getting the full story uh, for a whole set of reasons. I would blame NBC and CNN and, and MSNBC and others, Fox, um, for that. And uh, I don't think we're getting accurate uh, portrayals in many cases. I, th there are academics who are doing it. There are NGOs who are trying to do it. I noticed today in the story in the New York Times how many cybersecurity NGOs are involved in trying to track uh, security issues across the planet. I didn't realize that was such a huge growth industry. You can direct students there. Um, but uh, I worry about the quality of the information we're getting, frankly. Are you going to keep us informed? As much as possible. <laughs> now I've got to start writing again for Nebraskans for Peace and some other things, which I do have written plans to do. Um, I'm wondering, you mentioned the Heifer Project. Uh -huh. is, there, is that one of our best ways to support? It's, good. it's a good way. Is there any others that you would suggest? Actually, there are quite a few that do that kind of thing. I mean, they're very specific about how they do it. It's livestock provision and beekeeping and that kind of thing. Um, I just had a student of mine at Truman who got accepted into the Peace Corps, and he's a, he was told he's going to Paraguay, and, and, and he's going to do beekeeping, and unfortunately, he's allergic to bees. So uh, <laughs> there are some, some things that one has to deal with in this kind of thing. But Heifer's a good one. I mean, there, there used to be a whole bunch of these kinds of organizations that are doing this kind of work. I mean, Catholic Relief Services, uh, um, Lutheran Will Foundation does a lot on, on water development. Uh, some of the smaller NGOs. The difficulty for the smaller ones is it's just to get that much money to do some of these more larger scale kinds of projects. And heifer isn't everywhere. That's one of the problems. Um, and uh, you know, people don't always pay back their loans, although. I will say that some of the evidence on, if you look at microcredit schemes, women pay their loans back around 10 to 1 over men, which is interesting. It's why they target women for those kinds of schemes. Um, and that happens in Nebraska as well, in the Center for Rural Affairs, Rural Assistance kinds of projects and that kind of thing in Iowa and Missouri as well. Um, so there are organizations that do this, but to me, uh, a lot of them aren't operating in some of these places because it's tough, I mean, yeah. tough security-wise for their staff. I think that's one of the difficulties. Um, but I would say Heifer is a useful one. Good model. I mean, we tried that in Botswana. We, we started it for the, what was called the Remote Area Development Program. People have been able to build up herds 30 years.
years ago, there wasn't anybody with a herd of over three, and now the average herd size is 30, uh, which is a, a viable herd from a pastoralist perspective. It provides milk and, and uh, offtake for uh, both dung and, and, uh, and energy, as well as, as uh, sale and, and, and slaughter. So I think that some of those kinds of schemes actually work fairly effectively. But you do have to manage them. You need transparency. You need accounting. And that's the big difficulty. I mean, it's, that's the difficulty of South Africa, good accounting. It's a difficulty of some universities, I think, of them too. Um, I mean, just actually having to know where the money's going. We got one over here. Uh -huh. I missed the first part, so you might have already talked about some of this. But I'm, as people are talking, and I think we're talking about this more next time about the local, I mean there are so many places around here, churches that are going to different parts of Africa and doing, and maybe it's not a big bucks, but they're helping with education for kids or whatever. I'd um, say, yeah, the faith-based institutions are the backbone of this kind of thing, and it's individual churches that are doing it. Yeah, and anybody Absolutely. Could, could go and go with them. Sure. Ghana and Kenya and Tanzania, and I don't know where all, but anyway. Yeah. Um, and I always think of Save the Children. Is that still a good Save the Children's doing well. They've been doing that for how many years? And they try and connect 40. those kids and those war-torn with sure. their families or somebody from their family. I just can't believe how they can do that. But anyway, and I think of uh, uh, Bishop Tutu and his daughter. Mm -hmm. I haven't heard much about him lately, but I'm sure he's probably still. He's still active? Yeah, uh, I would think so. Yeah, he's still quite active. One of his daughters I worked with in the wildlife department in Botswana. She's now a doctor at Howard University. Um, but uh, the issue there is, um, I mean, South Africa is interesting because he's now become the opposition to, to Jacob Zuma. And he's the conscience of South Africa. Uh, Mandela was, and, and he has always been and still will be. So he's looking at questions of, of governance and questions of you know, anti-corruption and that kind of thing. And that's kind of a, a, a hard road to hoe. And, the peacemaker, and I couldn't believe how many countries he would go to and speak. And yeah, right including, in the including here. I mean, yeah. he spoke here for the, uh, for the Cooper uh, series and, and uh, has been in Missouri and Michigan and a number of other places. He regularly goes to Emory. He's still in good health, okay. uh, reasonably good health. And, well, that's a positive thing. If we had more leaders like that, that would be fantastic. Well, and how many actors and stuff have taken on some of these countries? George Clooney is Darfur, yeah. I mean, Congo, uh, Haiti, yeah, we, and we have... Uh, sure. Angelina Jolie's done a lot. What really. about our past presidents? Almost every one of them are helping in country. That's a key word. Almost every one. Emphasis on almost. Yes. We have probably time for one more question, but it depends on the length of the question and the answer. <laughs> Quick question. Microlending, what's your take on it? Is it having an effect at all in that uh, you know, significant? It was effect? having a, a pretty big effect, and uh, but I think it's, it's dampened down now for a whole set of reasons. They're actually asking more uh, faster loan repayments. Uh, the, the terms are not as good as they used to be. It's not the Bangladesh uh, Grameen Bank model that uh, Urens kind of envisioned in the 70s or whenever they created that in Bangladesh. Um, and it's now pretty much government run. Uh, and the state of Nebraska does it too, fairly effectively. Or certain elements in the state of Nebraska have done it. And other, other states have followed in the micro lending model. I think it's a very effective way of doing things. Because it gives people a small amount of money that they can use. We saw it in the Sutu recently where people were getting cell phones and then they were renting out the cell phones for family business and that kind of thing. Uh, or they were getting taxis if you could afford to buy a Toyota 180000 or something. Um, that's a lot of money for a micro lending scheme. But if you remember, uh, just before Bill Clinton stepped down, he and Hillary were uh, looking at micro lending schemes. Uh, in Uganda, and they went to Botswana and South Africa, where they don't have those kinds of schemes. And the difference is, is substantial. If you look at the way in which Uganda, for example, has uh, in the past at least affected uh, HIV AIDS rates, some of that's related to micro lending as well. So, you know, there's been a lot of progress in areas that, you know, um, and HIV is a classic one, and we hope that that can expand. Botswana, you know, holds itself up as having a a great HIV AIDS program, South Africa less so, Botswana unfortunately um, they have a, a good program but it doesn't reach everybody and one of the things I'm seeing is whole 
significant parts of the population that aren't being reached, and I think you have to pay attention to questions of equity in those. Um, but I'd say overall that micro lending's been very effective, um, and uh, it's changing and partly because the bankers get involved and don't let get started on bankers, but uh, they, uh, they they're trying to raise the rates, uh, and that makes it hard for people to repay. And that's true as much in Bangladesh and India, and in very different models. So a student that was in poli sci here, Melissa Baran Samuelson, looked at that as part of her dissertation uh, in poli sci, and, and others have looked at these kinds of micro lending schemes, and if they're state based or if they're NGO based, it makes a big difference. So. One quick one. Yeah. James Meredith. Yeah, James. What do you think of his advice? His advice being in specifically about forget about it or don't yeah, do it. That, that we should not be doing this. There is that argument out there that this uh, that aid creates dependency. I think on balance, aid has more benefits than uh, than, than negatives personally, uh, and certainly that's a, it's a big argument in a number of different arenas. Uh, the African American arena is saying, well, you know, our our help has caused greater problems in certain areas. Um, I don't necessarily agree with that, but that's certainly a perception um, that we should put more money into, say, uh, dealing with reparations for slavery. There are a lot of different kinds of arguments that come out of that. Um, but I think, personally, just from what I've seen in Africa, that a small amount of money can go a long way. I mean, we've never, in our 501c3, which is a nonprofit, uh, operated on more than 100,000 a year, uh, and I think we've educated probably several thousand kids, at least through primary school. And the kids that speak English now, and, and I think that's had some advantages because they've gone on to tertiary education, uh, and we're hoping to get them into graduate school, some in the U.S. Um, but that's just on the education side. I'd say, I think there's a lot of development assistance. That, I think USA did a wonderful job, personally, in a lot of ways. I mean, yes, there were some bureaucratic issues and some things you had to do to qualify, like an NGO had to have a Coopers and Librand or some other uh, group that would do accounting, look at your books, and that's hard for an NGO that operates on less than a million dollars a year. So that's a complication, and I think we could change some of our procedures to make it more flexible, but by and large, I personally think AIDS done a great job, and I think it helps the American people. I mean, it helps the American farmer, it helps lots of people. Uh, economically here uh, as well as overseas. So it's a great question. <laughs>